Okay, so in front of us here we have the surveyor that would be utilizing this semester here. Uh, the Ney surveyor. We can start off as we looked in the PowerPoint with the parts. We have the adjustable survey table. There's a locking screw on the side and a locking screw at the back for our uh, model. And this here we will use to change the path of insertion or maximize the ideal path of insertion and dislodgement for our, our case all our cases. Uh, we have the base of the surveyor, we have the uh, vertical arm, the horizontal arm across the top, and then we have the um, uh, adjustable survey uh, spindle. And uh, this has a little collet at the end that you can tighten all the instrumentation that we'll be using. Uh, if I go through those instruments again, uh, we can start uh, with, uh, all of you will have these, and I'll bring them up close. This is the analyzing rod. It is a straight shank. Uh, it's tapered at one end, not tapered all the way, but tapered to a smaller. This is our analyzing rod, or a smaller diameter. This is our uh, analyzing rod. Um, also in our kit that we're going to use, we have three uh, undercut gauges. Where's my third one? Oh, perfect. Oh, it's over there. We have a point five. Excuse me, point two five, point five, and point seven five. There's three of them. One has one line on it, and this is the point two five undercut gauge. And you see, it's a little thicker. It's got one line on it. If you want to remember it that way. And we've got the 0.5 undercut gauge. It has two lines on it, a little bit narrower. And then we have the 0.75. And that's a lot thinner with the, uh, obviously a, a thicker thimble on the end here. So here's our three undercut gauges. Uh, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and 0.75. For this semester, we'll be using the 0.25 primarily. So we have our analyzing rod, our three... Um, excuse me, our three uh, undercut gauges. We also have these two metal bits here, which are kind of half cylinders or half pipes. And these will be our graphite. We have lead, and they will hold the graphite in place. And this will be actually to hold the graphite, and it won't fracture once we put it into the collette of the uh, surveyor. So this is a, uh, a graphite holder. So when I tighten it, it doesn't snap the graphite. And I can expose as much of the graphite below as I need to. Uh, the last tool we have in our surveying kit is, uh, or surveying tools or instruments, is our um, wax scalpel. Um, and, and this is also used to reduce tooth structure in treatment planning some cast partials. If we were wanting to show a dentist uh, on a study model of how much tooth preparation would be needed to maximize uh, a guide plane uh, per se on a cast partial. So analyzing rod, three undercut gauges, uh, lead or graphite holder, and then the scalpel tool. So you have all the parts. And before the surveyor, when I look at this model, if this is our first model here, uh, I'll hold it up a little bit. We should have this is always kind of a questionable thing. Does the design come first from the prescription or does the design come organically from surveying? It's a bit of both. But I think with a lot of experience, you can also you know, look occlusively down on the model and you can see the height of contour of how wide the teeth are. Or I can hold it sideways and look at the undercuts on these abutment teeth. Now I'm going to give you a hint. When there's a cast partial denture, which ones are the abutment teeth? They're always, if not always, the teeth when there's edentulism. They're the teeth adjacent to the edentulous area. So in this case, it would be 3-4 and 4-4. Now, we'll go through a little exercise here. Um, because you need to know the design before we survey, because we're surveying for a certain design. I haven't talked about the minor connectors or the clasps, but I will. But what I did talk about was a major connector. So now here's our chance to draw our lingual bar major connector on our model. You're going to need a sharp blue pencil or red. 
If you don't have one, borrow one from your, your neighbor. If I look sideways at the model, I'm going to, now be very careful, I'm going to draw a straight line down. Kind of angles a little bit more distally, as you can see here. And on the other side, I'll do the same, straight down on the same angle of the tooth. This here will be the extent of my major connector, roughly. I'm going to now, I can do three to five millimeters below all these gingival margins and try to maintain the three to five millimeters below the gingival margin. Well, I'm getting a little close here. Let me go down a little bit lower then. Oh, I should have gone a little bit lower. Perfect. We'll go lower on this side and then I'll just uh, rub off the other one. Now, we don't know the profiles of the lingual bar because it's in our wax pattern kit, but we're going to get some experience with the width of the, the major connector. So here is my uh, major connector lingual bar. Let me just erase the little mistake I made there. I'll just use a little eraser there. And then let me mark it a little bit darker so you can see that this here will be the outline of my lingual bar. Not kind of, exactly where I want it to go. Now, should I have started with that? It's the first case I'm trying to get you to visualize what we're making here. And without, you know, we haven't even talked about acrylic retentions or the direct retainers. But I want to kind of get us moving forward with these two cases. And like I said, we can backfill the information as we go. So when I put this into the surveying table, I'll put the base of it against the two here. Uh, don't turn it around this way, because sometimes they can chip teeth and then it'll be closed. I mean, I guess it could be used, but I would get the base of the model against these two legs, and then I'll tighten it securely. So the model is securely in the table, and I've loosened this so I can have a lot of play where it's going, uh, left and right. I'm gonna start by using my analyzing rod into the collet of the surveyor. Let's loosen this top screw here so we can move this up and down. And that can stay open and we can move it up and down. Depending, you know, mine kind of moves down slowly. It's a little bit older. Yours, if it's moving too quickly, tighten it up a bit so you can maybe have a little bit of tension to it. You don't have to fall down and chip a tooth on a model. So, you know, this seems about right. If I'm pushing, if I can get into the picture here, uh, you know, if I'm pushing or pulling, it, it kind of has some rigidity to it. So, as I said in the presentation, we're going to start with a set zero, meaning somewhat tighten the base of the model. I could really kind of move it, but really softly. I'd have to really force it to move it in the table. So it's kind of almost tight all the way. So I told you the guide surfaces are the teeth adjacent to the edentulous area. So if I look at the guide surface of 3-4, let me try to get this a little bit closer here. I apologize if that's making you dizzy a little bit, but I'm trying to get a little bit closer. Just bear with me for a second. No, I'm getting really close now too. <laughs> okay, there we go. Let's zoom out a little bit here. There we go. Uh, I've got to get my hands in there in front of the camera. So if I can uh, see that this uh, analyzing rod is almost parallel to this uh, at the set zero position. Naturally, I made the first case a little bit easy. But to simulate what I'm talking about, if you were to move the model uh, distal and bring the analyzing rod in here, you can see that there's a huge undercut when I move the model backwards. And then as I move the model forwards, I've eliminated the undercut. So I think if we minimize, if not eliminate all undercuts, is fine. But we're doing one side of the arch. We got to be cognizant of the other side of the arch, if I can turn it both ways. So I'm really holding this model loose. Uh, I think it's a little bit too close for you. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let me move a little bit more. I think this is about right here. So you can see it all happening. So I'm holding this kind of in one hand, I can move it. I'm going to put the guide plane first on one side, hold it in that position, and look and bow hold on the other side that there is no undercut on that guide plane. So I've done the guide surfaces. 
Now, if I turn the model around this way in the same position, I want to mark the height of contour, or I'm looking at the heights of contour. Naturally, if I move the tooth, the model all the way this way, there is no undercut on this three, four at whatsoever. But if I moved it over to the other side, you can see how high the height of contour is on the four, four. So we need to balance or equalize the height of contour on the abutment teeth, left and right. At the same time, eliminate the undercut on the guide plane, or minimize if we can. Now you can't see behind, so I'll just do it this way here. That I've, I went back and I checked that I didn't move. So I'm doing left, and then I'm gonna go right. There is no, not everyone's will be the same. There's no uh, way, and there's no way that all of us can have the same one, but it'll be very, very close. Very close, that the height of contour is about the same height on both sides. There is no undercut on the distal guide surface of the bicuspid. And now I've dictated that this is my path of insertion. This is the angle at which the denture is going to go into the client's mouth. Now I mentioned earlier we need to tripod this position in case we lost our articulator, we took it home, or we moved the table, or the screw came loose. So what I'm going to ask you to do is uh, we take a sharp pencil, and if I put that analyzing rod up against the base of the model, without moving carefully now, I marked on both sides of the survey spindle. If I move it away, the survey spindle will go between those two marks as my x-axis or y-axis. And then I'll do the base of the model. Sharper the pencil, the better. So it doesn't, uh, make sure the model doesn't move now. Make sure the base doesn't move, which is attached to the model. So when I take this away, you can see that there's my x-axis, there's my y-axis. So what I'm saying is if I took the model off, I loosen the table, I'll go through this exercise, and so should you today. See if you can. It's not exact, but it's very close. I'll put the model in, tighten the base, or tighten the model holder, loosen the base until I line those, until I line that up on the one axis, and then I go to the back of the other model, and then now I have to tilt it back a little bit to get fitted into those two, into those two. I'll go back again and check it for a third time. And I think I'm pretty close there. Let me check from here. So that's in between the two lines. You can see, and this is in between the two lines here, very close. Oh, I can adjust a little bit more anterior. And then I'm going to go back and check that I didn't change here. And I didn't. And so slightly, it's not easy. There we go. So I've successfully tripoded the model by using the base. Now, another way to tripod the model, and remember, tripoding the model is just getting the model back to the base at a certain position that we've previously you know, dictated. I'm going to, and this is a good time to do this in this order. I would tripod with the analyzing rod. I'm going to get my lead uh, holder here and put the lead inside the holder so it doesn't break. And then I'm going to put this in my surveyor. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it's tough with the thing in front of me. Maybe I'll get a, a longer piece of lead. There we go. I'm going to sandwich it between the two half pipes of uh, metal. Because if I just put lead in the collet, it'll probably break. And I want to expose it for at least the length of a tooth. Because I'm going to have to mark a length of a tooth. And then I'll tighten it here, squeeze it in pretty good without breaking it. So that's in pretty firmly, uh, my lead. And then now to tripod another way, and this is kind of old school way or, or most popular, I think, that this uh, vertical member of the spindle doesn't move. And I can go lower or higher, but I'm going to pick a place on the model that it hits three, I don't want to go there, it's too high. Hopefully not on the pattern. 
See if I can get it without being on the pattern. Yeah, good, that's just above the pattern. So three widely spaced points, and I'll mark this one, and I'll mark this two, and I'll mark this three. I didn't move this vertical arm, that stayed stationary. And then once I've marked those three spots, I'm hoping you can see them, I'll get my sharp pencil and I'll exit in the same dimension, meaning the same length, and I'll do three, basically three bullseyes. Again, make sure this survey table, mine had a little bit of wax here, and it wasn't sliding smoothly. I'll get the wax off here. This is a little bit older. Okay. So I've tripoded by using my X and Y axis of the base. I've tripoded with three widely spaced points. I'm expecting you to do this today. You'll give it a go after I'm done here. So now, this is frozen in position here. This is my path of insertion. This here I've dictated that this is the way the denture is going to go in and go out at this uh, angle so I can block out undercuts at this uh, position. Now, right now, I'm not going to block anything out because for today's exercise, until we talk about all the clasps, I'm going to get you to practice your both models of path of insertion, tripoding, and uh, demarcating the height of contour. So I've got lead in here. Now, this is where some of you may break the lead. Be really careful. You need two hands. The left hand's moving, and the right hand is moving the spindle up and down so it doesn't interfere. And gently, you will mark the height of contour, as you can see I have on my bicuspid. Now, if I took the undercut away on the guide plane, but it's showing it just at the top, but really with my analyzing rod, as you can see with my lead, it's all the way down. It should be down by the gingival margin. It's marking it lower here on the lingual side. So we're going to do the lingual of the abutment teeth. all the way down here on this guide plane, this tooth is angled anteriorly. And then mark the height of contour on this bicuspid all the way around. So you can see that these line here, that's the widest part of the tooth at this angle. Now to practice, I guess you could run the lead gently. Not that we're gonna utilize any other teeth in the design, but to practice, you can do the height of contour of all the anterior teeth. Now, after we've done that, we're going to go one step further. And this is where it kind of gets a, a little, you know, must pay attention. So everyone's going to get this. Um, we're all familiar with the stainless steel rot wire clasp from last year that we bent on our acrylic partials from distal to mesial. I've put the 0.25 undercut gauge in. At the terminal end of this, or the mesial part of the tooth, I will bring that up until the undercut gauge touches the tooth. At that point, I've made a little scratch on the tooth, a tiny, tiny scratch, that this red dot is the terminal end of my clasp on 4-4. Four, four. And, oh, I'm sorry. And on 3-4. It's kind of high on this one, but I tried to make it easier for you. So, I'll just move the surveyor out of the way of kind of interfering. Once I have this red dot, this is the terminal end of my clasp. And then I can freehand draw. Now I said roughly a third to a half for a bicuspid. Third for a molar, half for a bicuspid on or above or the height of contour. So meaning if I took my abutment tooth, divided it in half, right? You don't have to do this the half part, but I want to visualize that only the mesial half is below the height of contour. How much? It's not down here. It's not down here. It's not here. It's exactly there at 0.25. A little semantics, you know, we're talking about the thickness of the pencil as well. So here I've put my 0.25 there, and I'll freehand draw my clasp, the first half below and the second half above the height of contour to the guide plane. On the lingual side of the tooth, 
we will put the reciprocal arm outlined in blue above the Haida contour. And I'm going to talk about, in another lecture, about the different clasps. For now, we will just copy that this is the reciprocal arm above the Haida contour on the lingual. And this is going to be our G clasp. So I want to specifically talk about the G clasp. And we'll outline the rest. You can see the rest preparation. The rest, what's the purpose of the rest? We're going to talk about it in the next lessons. Is the prevention of vertical displacement of the partial. The last thing we're going to do, which we haven't talked about, but you'll just follow me along, is the mesh retention or the acrylic retentive grid for the partial denture. And I'll just draw it here freehand. Kind of rushing along with you because you're looking at it going, what is he talking about? We haven't discussed this. And you can see how I've came off the lingual bar a little bit uh, higher for the mesh retention. I'm leaving room for acrylic. So acrylic will go all the way down here like a full denture, all the way around. This is the acrylic now, the, 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 the flange area, all the way around to the attached and detached mucosa, enveloping this retentive grid. The retentive grid is going to hold all these teeth on. As you can see how far back, roughly distal of six, if I was to put a, a six here, the distal of six is how far you're going to, you got to visualize five, six. So I'll do, you know, five, six, maybe here. And just shy of the bottom of the bar and then up on an angle, maybe 45 degrees. And then I'm just drawing some X's that you'll see the patterns that you'll receive. So here, my surveying really um, emphasized the design that I already had in mind. Now, we're the beginners, so after a while, we'll look at the model, we'll have a design in mind, and the surveyor will either prove or disprove or change our design. But we must have something in our mind already, uh, whether it's on a piece of paper from a dentist or uh, on our mind, what we're going to uh, discuss, or what we're going to pick out, not my discuss, as a design. So here we have tripoding, path of insertion, delineating the guide planes, um, marking the height of contour and marking our whole design on the model. A little bit of a fast track, but we got time to practice. If you don't like what you have in your model, steam it off, do it again. Nothing can go wrong. Here. But I want to talk about some clasps that we need to discuss. Um, and our first one, our first one, And I'll go into detail about this already, but all clasps have the four parts. But our first one will be the uh, acres clasp. This is kind of lecture number three and four together here. And I'll draw it, and you can draw it with me on a piece of paper, if you like. And we're going to go over this probably after lunch, after we do our designs. And every clasp has four parts. And here, I'll, just, I'll identify the parts. All clasps have a body or guide plane in GP. All clasps have a rest that prevents vertical displacement. All clasps have a retentive arm. These are the four parts of clasps. And all clasps have a reciprocal arm. And I'll use the acres class as an example. So... The rest prevents the vertical displacement. This sits on the occlusal side of the tooth. The body attaches it, you know, to the major connector this way. It's a minor connector. It goes, attaches it to the dentulous area and the uh, major connector. The reciprocal arm, I'm going to uh, color in blue here. The reciprocal arm blue would represent passive, meaning it's above the height of contour. If this is the height of contour. It's above. It does not have any retention to it at all. We know from our discussions that a third to a half, depending if it's a molar or bicuspid, will be a retentive uh, tip to it, engaging 0.25 millimeters of the undercut. I'll mark that in red. Everything else is passive, meaning no retention in the guide plane, no retention in the retentive arm up into the tip, and the rest is definitely not retentive. So we have our four parts. This first clasp 
is called the acres clasp. Also called, I'll put it in brackets, the E clasp. These are pretty much the two most popular names. I guess E, you can see it's like the letter E. And I'm looking occlusally on a molar or bicuspid, it doesn't matter. But you can see that all parts are the same for all clasps. We're going to go through each single one of them. And you can draw them and identify and label them. And you will commit these all to memory. Because we need to have these in our mind before we really go to the surveyor. So when we go to the surveyor, we have something in mind that we're going to use. And then my whole idea of this program is, when you look at the model, identify the Kennedy class. The Kennedy class will identify which major connector would be most suitable for that Kennedy class. Then the abutment teeth from that edentulous situation or from that model will identify which clasps will be better or best suited for class one, class two, class three, class four, or free end and tooth board. So it's all systematic. It's coming at you all at once. But really, we're trying to, our whole goal is, when we look at this model, I already know what to do. It's going to design itself after we finish the program that we will justify our decisions from the biomechanics of partial denture design of what we're going to do. So you must have that in your mind already. It's unfair. I can't tell you to have it in your mind. Now, the dentist should give us the design, and then we don't have to really think about what's in our mind, but they do not give us the design. They're relying on us heavily. Now, this is our uh, uh, first clasp of the super bulge clasps. So these are clasps that originate from above the height of contour. And we'll have something more formal coming. This is the super bulge clasps. And we have six of them. This is the most popular one, the acres clasp or the E clasp. And I'll draw the one that we're going to do for this project right here, that this is the... Well, we can maybe open this up. That this is the G clasp. So I'll identify... Okay, you can see G is backwards, but it's a G clasp. Uh, and this would be our body. This would be our reciprocal arm. Everyone has two arms. And this is our retentive arm. And this is our rest. The rest prevents vertical displacement. Simple. The body attaches it, is our guide plane, attaches it as a minor connector to the major connector. The retentive arm, a third, roughly, or a half, tip, is retentive below the height of contour. The rest, the reciprocal arm, counteracts the forces of the retentive arm and is above the height of contour. The reciprocal arm, or bracing arm is another term, is above the height of contour and reciprocates the action of the retentive arm. So if the active arm wants to move the tooth this way, there's an equal opposite reaction. Sounds like Newton's law. An equal opposite reaction of force from the reciprocal arm, bracing the tooth as the retentive arm flexes at 0.25 millimeters below the height of contour. Acres class, G class. Excuse me, acres clasp or E, G clasp. What's the difference? Well, let's put them side by side. Really, they both have a body that go to the major connector. And side by side, all that's different is the rest is the opposite of the guide plane on the reciprocal arm. That's the only difference. And as we draw all our clasps, you'll see that there's not much difference. They all have the four parts. We're moving things around. We move the rest on the other side. If I would draw on a dotted line, put the rest here, take the rest away there, you've got yourself an acres clasp. So we've got our two super bulge clasps. And I'm going to talk about them in more detail, but... Now we can all draw them together if you wish, or we can draw them together later uh, through the formal lecture, which all come live. 
here we have something, our third most popular super bulge clasps. And super bulge clasps are those that have approached the undercut, the retentive arm from above the height of contour. Whoa, a little skinny there. Now, this is also called the double E, or the Bonwell clasp, or more commonly, the embrasure because it approaches from the minor connector here, or the body approaches from the embrasure. So this is the body or minor connector. We have two rests, double the fun. We have two reciprocal arms. Well, I'll put them on this side. and two retentive arms. This is usually used when there's no um, edentulous area on the opposing side. So there's no modification, let's say, on the other side of this tooth or tissue supported partial denture. Everything is blue, means above the height of contour, means passive blue. So you're gonna use a blue pencil, the rests are not retentive. And the only thing that's retentive in red is this terminal third of the retentive arm. And the rest is blue. Now, we've got embrasure. we got double acres. we got bond will. Clasp. My goodness, a lot of terms. Oh, we've got double acres. Bond will. We've got double E. So it's got four names. Why am I giving you four names? Because everyone uses something different. And I think you need to be familiar that these are all synonymous with the same thing. So what's the difference? Well, basically it's two of these put together. Why two? There's no modification. Or maybe one tooth is questionable. And when one is extracted, we'll just have the one clasp left. So we've got uh, E, G, double E. I might as well keep going. Uh, we've got the hairpin. And these ones I won't spend much time on, but you need to know what they look like. And uh, this one looks exactly like an acres. Oops. Let's take this connection out here. Where's my eraser? My goodness. Uh, typical. I'll color it in. This is the reciprocal. And this is the retentive body. Rest. Retentive. R-E-T. And it doubles back. It has like a hairpin to it here. Really rarely used because it's so rigid. Everything else is blue. The rest, the reciprocal arm above the height of contour. The rest to prevent vertical displacement. And basically, it comes back. And probably because the uh, height of contour is something like this. If I do the H, C here. So there is so under, the undercut is near the guide plane. So it kind of doubles back. And you'll see pictures of this in your textbook and in situations. So, uh, really rarely used, but you need to be familiar with it. We got acres, double acres, G clasp, which we used on our first case, by the way, G clasp, with the musicals arrest. We've got our hairpin, and we've got our uh, back action. Oh boy. Back action clasp, which is basically the same as a um, G clasp, except the minor connector originates from the rest. And then this is the body. And keep remember, this is edentulous here. So if we looked at our model like this, this would be the edentulous side I'm discussing here. 
So instead of having the minor connector over here, like the G clasp, the minor connector, the body goes here. And I'll do the whole lingual bar here. And it's open here. So the minor connector, confusing. This is the most confusing one to understand. Retention, reciprocal. The end third is retentive. Now, we'll, we'll, I'm just doing this for schematic sakes, but in class we'll do the whole red line. Like I've done here, I did the whole retentive arm as a red line. We already know that it's just the third, but I'm just trying to hammer home the point that it's not all below the height of contour. Now, this is like one arm. It doesn't join here at the guide plane. So if this is my guide plane here, guide plane, it's open. So it's basically one arm above the height of contour down with a minor connector that joins the major connector down here. Confusing, I know. We need to go over this one in pictures, which I'll have. These are all the super bulge clasps. How many do we have here? Acres, G, hairpin, double acres, back action, one more most likely on a molar, and I'll do it this way with the edentialism up here, E for edentialism, that will have a, um, okay, I'll do it in blue. No, I'll do it in pencil. Uh, and this is one arm, but the minor connector originates from the edentulous area. So this is the body or the minor connector. This is the rest. The reciprocal arm here. And retentive end. This one, if you haven't guessed it, is called the ring clasp. I think that's it. How many do we have all together here? I don't think I've missed one. One, two, three, four, five, six. Super bulge clasp. Ring clasp because it goes around, you know, around 350 degrees of the tooth. It goes all the way around. Now, I know you might be saying, well, so does the back action. But as you see, the back action originates from the major connector, where this originates from edentulous space. Two are very confusing. And there is a guide plane in metal here. There is no guide plane on this one. You will see in pictures, reinforce. So uh, rest assured, I know you're a little confused with the ring clasp and back action, but we'll, we'll clear it up. So here's our super bulge clasp. All these clasps. Oh, we got one, two, three, four, five, six. And I only had six pieces of paper. <laughs> All six approach the undercut from above the height of contour from above the height of contour, meaning they come from the top down. Now we've got the other clasps are the infra bulge clasp. These clasps approach from below the bulge or below the height of contour. And let's talk about them. Number one, there's only four, I think. I should know, is the eye bar. Okay, I think I have to draw a tooth so it looks like, where's the eye bar? This is the buccal side of a bicuspid. And I'll do another tooth over here. And this approaches the undercut, the height of contour is here. Approaches the undercut, yes, at 0.25 still, below the undercut. And then I should make it a little bit higher then, how's that? So this is 0.25 here, below the height of contour. And this retentive tip here, below the height of contour, this is all a reciprocal arm, or the body of the clasp, excuse me. Uh, there's a rest up here, and then a reciprocal, most likely on the other side, and a guide plane. So these parts are separated, and this is our most popular for bulge clasp, and you need to see it occlusally. So if you see it occlusally, it'll look like there's a bar here, a rest here, and or we'll do a guide plane there, and we'll do a rest here. If this is my... you know, bicuspid uh, rest here, uh, occlusally. Boy, I butchered this one up. Let's do a bigger one. Let's do a bigger one. Let's do a bigger 
occlusal. I'm having a hard time drawing three-dimensional here. So this is the occlusion of a bicuspid. Can we suspend the belief of my fantastic anatomy? And this is the occlusal view of a bicuspid. Which bicuspid? I'm not sure yet. Lower five. The rest is the occlusal rest with a minor connector down to the to the lingual bar. The occlusal view, remember. We have a guide plane here. And perfectly, I ran out of room. We have an eye bar here. So even though the parts are separated, it's still four parts. Rest prevents vertical displacement. Minor connector of the rest to the major connector. A guide plane and a retentive arm. And sometimes we can add the reciprocal arm if we want on this design here. So there's an arm on the lingual side here joined to the guide plane. I think that's a better drawing, I think. That makes sense to me. I'm hoping it does to you now. That first one was like, oof. And this is my mesh retention. So if I was to draw the eye bar to clear it up on my model, and I wanted 0.25 in the middle, don't do this on your model, I'll just do it on mine, then I could freehand down, and this would be my eye bar infrabulge approaching the undercut from below, and then my minor connector rest, I would attach it here. That's the only difference. And we would choose which one we want. Do you want to use the eye bar or you want the G-clasp? I think for the first case, we'll do the G-class. We need to have, you know, three to five millimeters down here. We're going to talk about formally the room we need for this, this eye bar. And there has to be a certain length. So we've got the eye bar. And I've got some uh, PowerPoint pictures a lot better than my, than my art attack drawings. And then I'll just draw them here uh, so you're familiar with the terms. The Y bar, you guessed it, YMCA, the Y bar. So we've got the I bar, the Y bar. These are all approaching the undercut from below. This is the buckle surface of a bicuspid. We've got the number three, the modified or half Y. Now this one here, instead of the Y, it's also called the Roach clasp. You need to be familiar with both. I, Y, or Roach clasp, same thing. And here we got half Y or half Roach, any term you want to use. But you got to be familiar with both. And why half? Well, I guess they don't want to show the other half, you know, from the aesthetic point of view. Or maybe the height of contour on this bicuspid is at the distal half. So there is no undercut on the mesial half. So why go there? We'll just use the distal half. Half roach, Y, I. And then this one I'll draw the, the, the surface of a bicuspid because it's easier to visualize. And the last one we have is the J bar. Now this is going over really quickly. But just, you know, we need to know all the names. We got six and four, ten. Ten clasps. And the J-bar, which I, is not the best, but it starts at the... I should do red. It goes as an I-bar, infrabulge clasp. It goes to the distal side of the tooth and then goes across the whole front like this. The J-bar. Looks like a Y-bar if I came out of the middle. But because the clasp originates from the end and covers the whole facial or buccal side of the tooth, is the J-bar. I think these are the most popular terms. We can argue about all the terms that you hear in the marketplace. God knows what these things people call them, all kinds of things. But these are the most popular, I think. I, Y, half, and a J is our infrabulge clasps. And uh, we're going to draw them all in class in your workbook. Uh, you're going to visualize them. You're going to memorize them. If you need to draw them, I think we'll reinforce memorizing them. And um, I'll go over live uh, the presentation, possibly if we have time, on each clasp. Uh, sometimes I put the clasps ahead of the 
the surveying, and sometimes the surveying ahead of the class. And they have to really come at the same time, because if we don't know the class, then how do we know what we're surveying? So uh, I'll leave it at that, and uh, we'll, we'll practice that exercise. Thank you.